want to talk to you today about a big fancy term here, but I think you'll understand it when I'm done, generational purpose. Boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? And part of my prayer is the ability to share truths that can be very deep for the youngest in the Lord and something for the oldest. And this is something has for all of us, and we need to really understand our generational purpose. Father, I pray, God, that the word will be alive, that you'll help us to be able to share this word, that it might bring life. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, we had kind of a shock. Those of us who uh, are acquainted with Miles Monroe, we heard that he died with his, whole, with his family and his leaders in the church as they were landing in the uh, Bahamas. And about a year ago, we were at his church. We were just going to meet him. And we don't understand why somebody such a well-known preacher and in the Word, and we don't understand why something like that happens. See, Pastor, why did it happen? Let me tell you. I have no idea. But I do know that God's in control. Amen. But Miles Monroe exemplifies what Jesus said. Jesus said, John 7, 6, he, Jesus replied, now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go at any time. Now, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I want us to understand that we can go at any time. You know that? Yes. We can. That's why we need to ask God that we fulfill our purpose in this life. Amen. Miles Monroe, this year, was at a conference just before he died, and he talked on how to die effectively. What a subject, huh? Just before he died. And he said this, live beyond the grave and secure your legacy and pass it on. According to Miles, he said, that is, what, that is what you leave for people. It's your character. You leave your character. Now, somebody once said there's two great days in a person's life. The day they were born and the day they discover why. I kind of like that. Two great days when you were born and you discover why you were born. You were born at this time, this age, for a reason. You were not born in the 1500s. You were not born in 3000 BC. <clears throat> you were not chasing dinosaurs with a spear. You're here today, and it's not an accident. I want to show you a verse that brings this out, and it's my theme verse for today, Acts 13:36. And I'm going to use the New King James, unless I tell you otherwise, because some, the reason I use New King James sometimes and other times in New Living is I use the New King James when it's passages that people are familiar with and, and they're used to hearing it often because New King James usually keeps the King James form, just brings it up to date. But it says, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. Interesting verse. David, when he was served his own generation, now NIV and other translations, it comes out, when David had served the purposes of God in his generation. Now, you were born with a purpose in this generation. All of you. Some of you sit and you say, well, I understand Pastor you or Joy or someone else, but you were born with a purpose in this generation or else you would not have been born now. Isn't that logic? God had a purpose for you. And many people never recognize the purpose of God in their life, and it's a great tragedy because I believe that we can, and I'm going to discover, we'll discover together today, we need to realize God's plan for us. Only through discovering his purpose can we expect genuine fulfillment in our life. What is the unique plan of God for your life? What is the unique, unique purpose in your life? There is a unique purpose for you that only you could fail. There is something only Anita can do. Something only Ruby back there, good to see Ruby, can do. God has called you for that purpose. God has a purpose for every person, and God has a purpose for every generation. Now, that's a sermon in itself. 
Martin Luther served his purpose. He fought against the Catholic Church that at that time was teaching that you could gather money and if you put the money, you could go to heaven quicker. If you were in purgatory, you could go. And he saw uh, the houses of prostitutions for the priests. He saw all these things going on and he rose up, became a man of his generation and served his generation by starting a reformation. John Wesley, when he became a young man in England, they said that every man, woman, child went to bed drunk in England. It was a terrible time, uh, constant lawlessness and drunkenness. And yet, when he arose and started the Methodists, he started preaching sanctification. He started the first banking system, among other things. He did a lot, and he rose, and he became a man of his generation. In 1948, I've told you about the Hebrides in Scotland, which is a small group of islands outside of the coast of Scotland where it rains almost constantly. And the churches there were in a state of darkness and the young people were not interested in God, but there was seven young deacons. And they decided to pray for revival and they went into a barn and it was so cold they would cover themselves with blankets. And then there was two ladies, very old ladies, 82 and 84, that one was almost blind, one was stricken with arthritis and couldn't move, and yet they heard the word of God, they interceded, and they became people of their generation, serving the purpose that brought one of the greatest revivals in the last hundred years, where overnight the Spirit of God fell on the island, nobody had preached the word, there was people in the ditches crying out for God in the middle of the night, hundreds. The police station had three, four hundred knocking at the door weeping and they came to the policeman because he knew he was a Christian and they said what do we do with our sins and no one had preached a word but these people had served the purpose of their generation Hallelujah. doesn't matter if you're crippled blind doesn't matter if you're old or young you can serve God's purpose in your generation God has a purpose God has a purpose for our generation I believe the purpose in our generation is the preparation of the bride. Yes. I believe a purpose for our generation is to watch and help bring the glory of the Lord to fill the earth. There's going to come a great revival. We're going to be part of it. But we're also called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We're called to prepare the bride because the bridegroom is coming. And like I always say, I can smell the wedding cake. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe the Bible keeps a book of records of what we've done to fulfill the purposes of God in our life. See, Pastor, where can you get that from? Well, the Bible says in Revelation 20, 12, I saw the dead and the small and the great standing before God and the books. Notice it says books, pearl, were opened. And um, Malachi 3.16 says, Then those who feared the, feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them, so a book of remembrance was written. So we see there's different books, and I, I got a suspicion that God's, I know he's recorded the sins of people. And on that day, when we stand before God, and we, we think we lived a holy life, and when he gets to volume 169 of our life, we're going to say, I deserve hell. But you see, when you and I, when they open our book of our lives with our sin, they're all blank because the blood of Jesus has taken them away. Hallelujah. But there is a book of remembrance, and I really believe that you have a purpose in your life, and God delights that you fulfill that purpose so much for, more, so much so he writes it down. Why? So he'll forget. He might not forget. No, God never forgets. I believe it's part of that glorious heritage of the children of God that all through, her all through heaven in eternity, I'm going to go in the book and I'm going to read that about the exploits of Bob. I'm going to go see about the exploits of, of Carol. And I get inspired. Of course, you're going to leave out all the bad stuff. Hallelujah. <laughs> because that's forgiven. That's gone. Let me get in be gone before I get in trouble there. I, I, I really like that. Now, the word says that David served God's purpose in his generation. The Amplified says it like this. For David, after he had served God's will and purpose and counsel in his own generation, he served God's purpose 
God's will, now those are linked. If we serve God's will, we'll always serve his purpose. Do you hear me? If we follow the will of God, we will always complete his purpose in our life. But let me go on. David did this. Now let's see how David did this. David received a vision, a purpose for his generation on a day when an old, crusty old prophet came to his dad's house. And the Bible tells us that when Samuel came, 1 Samuel 16, 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. I believe that's when he got his vision that he was going to be royalty one day. When you and I accept Jesus Christ into our, our hearts, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we're anointed, and we get a taste that we are meant to be royalty one day. You hear me? David received that anointing to become a king. It was a while before he did. I believe when, when Samuel poured that oil on David's head, he received a vision of what God had called him to be. When you and I come to Jesus, we may not have a clear vision, but we inside God's planted it. I believe that. I believe every one of you, and before I'm done, I'm going to show you areas. I believe God's planted in your life a seed. Our problem is we never water that seed. Let's see what he did. Let's go on about David. Let me say this, that we cannot truly fulfill the purposes of God without the Holy Spirit. We cannot fill the purposes of God unless we're filled with the Spirit of God. David could not do it unless he had that anointing, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the oil and the anointing that came. You and I cannot fulfill God's purpose in our life with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We have to say, Holy Spirit, take all of me. And we need to be baptized in the Spirit, not only baptized in the Spirit, constantly being filled with the Spirit, because as we are filled, not spilled, we will. Walk in the purposes of God. Amen? Amen? David knew this, so much so that when he lost fellowship with God in Psalms 51, he said, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, the Holy Spirit came upon people in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it comes within people. Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you. But that consciousness of his presence that deep fellowship he longs for, that can be disturbed. And we need that fellowship in order to grow into our purposes. That makes sense to you, church. Let me go on. The anointing makes the ordinary extraordinary. The anointing takes the ordinary. It'll take a little shepherd boy that's kind of scrawny little shepherd boy that all his brothers look down upon and make him into a mighty man of God who wrote psalms and hymns that we even sing today, who could kill giants, who could rule and make Israel a diamond in that day from a little shepherd boy. Amen. When the anointing comes on the ordinary, he, God will do something extraordinary. We even see this in Saul. Saul was not a good king. We know that. We know that Saul did bad things. But at the beginning, when God first called him, in 1 Samuel 10, 6, he met prophets that were worshiping. And it says this, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, this is Samuel talking, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. How many know when the anointing comes, we're turned into another man? When I first went to Sweden, people often despised me because I was kind of like the ugly American. Americans were not popular because it was the midst of the Vietnamese War. I would go to churches, and in the churches, they were taking up offerings for North Vietnam just before I preached, believe it or not. The Communist Party would come in and do it. They would have pictures in the church. Uh, I remember one picture where they, they cut out a soldier who was digging a foxhole and put babies uh, in. You can see they just cut it out. And so Americans were kind of despised. So when I, uh, not everybody, but a lot of them. So when I went out to preach and do things, I had a lot of trouble. And when I first met people, they would say, well, I don't like you. I don't like Americans. 
But then when I started preaching and the anointing changed, all of a sudden they changed their tune. Because what became ordinary, Jim Ordinary, just an American, became a messenger of God with the gospel, and we saw over 20,000 people get saved. Wow. That's a, that's, God can take the ordinary, do the extraordinary. Amen. But the anointing needs to be cultivated in your life. The anointing needs to grow in our life. David did this by obeying God and worshiping him. The anointing needs to go in our life, flow in our life, and there also, before we come into the purposes of God, we also need to go through a time of preparation. Now, this can be frustrating because sometimes we feel our whole life has been a preparation. Now, I'll get to that later, but let me just add this footnote. Don't you think that Abraham got tired of waiting for God's purposes when he was 100 years old? God, you promised me, but all that was going on before was preparing him for the great things about to come. Now, the anointing needs to be cultivated. You first of all need to start to believe that you have been anointed for something. Okay? You have to understand you have already received, the Bible says you've already received, received an anointing. People come up and say, Pastor, pray for me that I might have an anointing. Well, yes, we can pray for different anointings, blessings upon you. Uh, but let me tell you something. The Bible says you've already received an anointing. That when you got born again, the Holy Spirit came in your life. Every one of you has the Holy Spirit living in you. If you know Jesus Christ, where's the Holy Spirit? Hello, where is he? He's in you. You've received an anointing, but we need to cultivate it. We need to go through preparation. I met so many people that want to be used to God, but don't want any preparation. David went through a time of preparation. David was a prepared vessel before he met Goliath. The Bible says that he was out there, he met a lion, he met a bear. David learned in the wilderness. He learned by the way he was treated with his brothers. He learned how to be a good king. I can imagine David saying, what in the world am I stuck with this sheep? And there weren't many sheep, because remember his brothers would say, oh, David, you're just out there with those few sheep. I bet David's sitting out there saying, my brothers get to go and have all the fun at war, if you can call war fun. And I'm stuck with these sheep. But how many know that that was his school, and he was known, and he became king as the shepherd of Israel. That was what they was known as, because he had learned the wonderful psalm we have, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Something happened in his heart. David also understood spiritual authority in his life. You will never come into your purpose till you are ready to show honor and respect and uh, understand authority. And let me explain it. Uh, and it, we, we have a book on honor that I just talked with someone about. And when we get our new building, we're going to have a class on it. And honor is not that we idolize people. How many know the idol honor begins in your home? with your spouse, and honor begins many different places. But let me just throw a couple things at you. David understood it, because we read in 1 Samuel 24, where David is in a cave hiding, and Saul comes, who's hunting him, and he sneaks down, he could have killed Saul, so he says, I'm gonna show him what a good guy I am. So he cuts off a piece of his skirt. This is when men wear skirts. That's what it says to King James, a skirt, right? It must be like a Scottish kilt, my ancestors. They cut off a piece, and after David went there to go, ha, 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 look what I got, the Bible says he was pricked at his heart, and he asked God to forgive him because he had sinned. See? He had sinned. That's not the verse. He had sinned by doing that. And what we need to, David understood authority. Saul was a bad guy. Just because someone's bad doesn't mean you treat him the wrong way. Peter says it like this, 1 Peter 2.10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring reviling accusations against them before the Lord. Go to 1 Peter 1 and 2. You see the same thing. 
what this means. The word dignitaries is also translated in, in the Bible, honor. And if you use the word honor here, it says, whereas speak evil to those that should be honored. What does this mean? Let's put it in David's life. Saul was a bad guy. Yet David understood the difference between showing honor and just accepting what was wrong. Let me give an example. Paul and Barnabas. In the Bible, Acts 15, we read that Paul and Barnabas had a break, a fight with each other over John Mark. They went each their own way. But if you study the Bible, even though they disagree, they never stop showing honor to one another. You never once read in the Bible Paul talking bad about Barnabas. In fact, we would never even know about it if Dr. Luke had not taught, told us about it. It did not come from Paul. In fact, what Paul said later, he actually says in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, that Barnabas has a good ministry. You should support him with your money. And later, even in Colossians 4, 10, which is very interesting in the Amplified, a note they have, he says, my Antiochus, my fellow prisoner, wishes you to be remembered to you, as does Mark, the relative of Barnabas. You receive instructions concerning him, that's Barnabas. If he comes to you, give him a hearty welcome. That doesn't sound like he was mad at Barnabas, does it? And the footnote says this, that the translation that you should give him a welcome is, quote, a very strong verb. You should give him a very hearty welcome. That doesn't talk about someone cutting down somebody. You can disagree and still show honor. You can disagree. And that's what David did. And if we're ever going to come to what God wants us to be, we need to understand that. When Jer Joy and I worked for, for uh, Gerald Durstein, uh, you all know Gerald Durstein. He's going to come here. He wants to come here and share one day. He's the one where the charismatic move started in his yard, house. And Joy and I used to live in that house. They have a conference center up in Minnesota. And Gerald is a Mennonite. Gerald likes these Gaither music and these older music. And Joy and I were pastors there for a couple summers. And we put on the music that he liked. Not that we liked, that he liked. Now, we like Gaithers, but not every day. And he come up to me and he said, Jim, I'm so thankful for you. I had a pastor last year that was here. And he put on all this rock music and thing. I couldn't stand it. When I'm working here, I couldn't stand it. I said, but what did you do? You're the, you're the father of the, church, the house here. And he says, well, I told him. But he says, I'm going to do it my way, whether you like it or not. That's not honoring the vision. It was not my house. He was the father of the house. And when we honored Gerald, you wouldn't believe how he blossomed. You wouldn't believe how God blessed him and even opened up uh, his heart. Right, Joy? It was a wonderful time. We need to learn to understand authority. We need, he understood, David understood authority, but he also understood another kind of authority. He understood that you and I have authority against evil spirits. And every, remember when, when Saul would begin to be troubled by an evil spirit, well, actually King James' evil spirit does not say evil spirit, but it was a spirit, a tormenting spirit from the Lord, which meant that he sent like something to, to make him uncomfortable. And David would start worshiping and that would relieve it. We'll come back to that later, but let me tell you, we have authority over demonic spirits. We have authority over the enemy. You have authority. Every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest. Are you with me? Let me go on. How do we serve the purposes of God in our generation? Using what we've been talking about. Like I said, the NIV says, for David had served God's purpose in his own generation, then he fell asleep. In the Bible, when it says you fell asleep, that means that they, they died. When Christians, when Christians die, the Bible uses the term fall asleep. A gentle word instead. Now, how did he serve God's purposes? Let me just give you a couple. He served God's purpose in his family. How many know that Matt, you, first of all, God comes first in our life. We serve his purposes first. But you cannot serve God's purposes without also serving the purpose that God, of your family that God placed you in. Do you hear me? 
David did that. I think this is amazing. God created the family for a purpose. He placed you and your family for a purpose. For most of us, like my family's not a good family. It's very dysfunctional, and, and, and I got out of there quickly. But then God said, go back and just love on them. And that's what I've been doing, just loving on them. And you wouldn't believe the change in my parents. But not all of us maybe had a good family, but God still placed us there for a reason. You might be the only reason your family sees Jesus. You might be the only one in your family that is salt, lifting up the name of the Lord. God created us in our family for a reason. David served the purpose of his family by all, we read this, that all his life till he became king, king supported care in his family. In 1 Samuel 16, 11, he was watching the sheep when Samuel came. That was his dad's business. Let's make it modern language. He was watching his dad's store. The Bible also tells us that even when he was in the palace and he got a job, he had a job in the palace, and his job in the palace was to be an armor bearer and be a worship leader for Saul. When he had his job in the, when he had it, now I would think, now I got my job in the palace. I get to eat with the king. Man, I'm dressed in fancy clothes. I don't stink like a, a shepherd anymore, which they really stink. We read, read old documents that they, you could smell a shepherd 30, 40 feet away. He, and more if he was uh, downwind. They were not allowed to testify in court and things because they stunk so bad. Can you imagine being in with Saul, being, have your job, and then the Bible says that while he had his job, Samuel 17, 15, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with his sheep in Bethlehem. Isn't that an amazing verse? That even when he's in the palace, he says, I'm going to go down and help my dad with those sheep right now. Now, you're a member of God's family. You may never had a good family, but you, God placed you in this family. The Bible says he places us in the body as it pleases him. You have been placed here. You might think, well, there's a place I can maybe expand more, be more. But God placed you here right now because you have a purpose here. We need to understand that we are, you're here for a purpose in this church. You're here for a purpose in this city. We need to care for the family business. What's the family business? Feeding the sheep by the word of God and protecting the sheep and encouraging the sheep. We need to care about our, our father's business. What's our father's business? Living and establishing his kingdom on this earth. We need to care for our brothers and sisters by ministry, compassion, prayer, and encouraging. We need to find the lost sheep by evangelism. You see, we're called to serve in the family. You have a place here. You don't look excited about that. You have a place here. The next one, which I promised Chris, I said, Chris, you're going to like this. You have to serve God in your workplace. David's destiny to the throne had a time of preparation. It said this in 1 Samuel 16, 21. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. I said, gee, thanks. I get to take a spear for you. What's it mean? Number one, let me tell you, he proved himself faithful, so faithful he was promoted because that was a high stand thing at that time to be an armor bearer. Plus, he was greatly loved of Saul. Your purpose may be in your, God's purpose he has for you might be in your, your, your workplace. That where you are, you're going to be a salt and a light in the workplace, an apostle in the marketplace is what we call it. Now, let me say this too. Before you become the king, you got to be an armor bearer. Ouch. I know so many people want to instantly preach, instantly come. People come to the store and they say, Pastor, I want to have this ministry do this and this. I say, okay, serve for a while. Serve? Goodbye. We all begin by serving. I began by serving Gerald Durstein. I'd travel with him and carry his Bible. 
Now, what it means to be an armor bearer, some people take it too far and they think it reads slave. That has nothing to do with that. An armor bearer is someone who says, I'm available to be used any way you want me to be used, God, for your kingdom, and I'm going to support those ministers where I am. Does that make sense to you? Let me go on. In the workplace, we are to serve in our workplace as we serve Christ. Ouch. Well, I don't like my boss. Pray for him. See, that's what Austin tells me all the time. No, Austin works for Chris. <laughs> How many know our workplaces? I know a lady in Sweden, and she made the uh, chocolates. You know, you buy good Swedish chocolates, the one with filling inside. And she worked on the machine that it had come, and she put in the filling inside. That's my kind of job. <laughs> well, that or an ice cream factory. And the machine broke. And she'd take her Bible and read it at the lunch break, and they all would laugh at her and make fun of her. But she was faithful in her work. She was always on time. She was always encouraging. But she still read it. And one day they came, said, the machine's broken. You got contact with God. Amazing how they think that. You pray for her. She said, well, I'll pray for the machine. I'll go out there and pray. You what? So she went out to the machine, laid her hands on it, and it started working instantly. She told me, and this lady was like about 60, 65, just about to retire, and, and easy to overlook because just one of these people that had been there in the background, but she always had her witness at work. She said, now, now Jim, she says, every time the machine breaks, they come to me first and ask me to pray. <laughs> Be faithful in your workplace. He served in his workplace. David brought refreshment to his workplace. Do you bring refreshment to your workplace or you bring a bunch of complaining and doubt? The Bible tells in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it was whenever the spirit from the Lord was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. We are light. We are healing. We should bring light and healing into the workplace with us. David brought healing and positive and light into the workplace. Do you bring complaining and problems, or do you say, I have the light, I can bring light, I'm going to pray for my work, I'm going to pray for my job, and well, I'm going to look at this as a stepping stone in God's plan in my life. How do I know that God didn't plan that this was the purpose to be here, and I'm going to be able to meet somebody tomorrow and get a chance to change their life with the gospel? Amen. He served the purposes of God, David, by not his own glory, but to glorify God. When David was going to fight with Goliath, the Bible says, 1 Samuel 17, 47, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. He gave all the glory to God. He didn't go out there and say, I'm going to do this because I get to marry the king's daughter. I'm going to do this because everyone's going to look up to me if I do it. I'm going to do this to show them what a great warrior I am. I'm going to do this to be famous or, man, I, I, I'm on 53 channels preaching right now. So what? What's the purpose of God for you? Is the purpose is not to be seen for the sake of being seen. The purpose is to glorify God. David knew that. That's why the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. When Austin's working up in, in Disney, and you may think, oh, wow, what's he doing there? If that's his job, he's doing it for the glory of God. Who knows what life he might save just by having the joy of God, and people will say, why are you so happy? What's, the, what's different with you? And you say, let me show you. It's called John 3, 16. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let me draw this together. If there was one statement, one statement about your life. Let's say Miles Monroe died this week. We don't know if we're going to be together as a group like this ever again. No, but none of us have a guarantee for tomorrow. But we do have a guarantee of eternal happiness. But let me tell you, if there was one word, let's say something happened, and there was one word or one phrase, not one word, one phrase that someone would write on your life, what would you want? Would Danny want, oh, he was the best Christian artist? I don't think so. 
even though he is, in my opinion. Is it going to be, oh, Austin was the greatest worship leader of her? Was it that person was the best preacher? That person was a good mother? That No. What would be the greatest phrase? It would be what they said about Joshua that was, it says in Judges 2.8, now Joshua, the son of Nun, obviously that's funny. It sounds like the son of Nun, N-O-N-E, but it's N-U-N, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, when he was dying, the first time in Joshua's life this phrase is used, when he was dead, they looked over his life, and the epitaph they put on his life was, he was a servant of God. Amen. Isn't that the phrase you want, Danny? He was a servant of God. Isn't that what you want, Austin? He was a servant of God. It's used to Moses 16 times. For me, I want what was recorded for David, which is similar. What was recorded of Luther, what was recorded of so many heroes. We read the per thing, uh, the first, insert your name, but Jim served the purposes of God for his generation. Why? Because he was a servant. Amen. Put your name in it. Say, but, say your name, say your name out loud. Serve the purposes of God in his generation. Did you serve the purposes of God in your generation? Yeah. But pastor, it's so hard. It seems like I'm always working and nobody else is showing up. It seems like I'm the one always has to give. Why can't other people give? I'm the one always giving. I'm the one always praying. Where's the other prayer one? Maybe it's because that's what you were called to do in this generation. Amen. Do you ever think of that? Maybe the reason, it's easy, but I know I've been there. You think, Lord, why does anybody else preach? Why does anybody else go out and win the loss on the streets as I used to do all the time? I was always on the streets. I go on the streets with a newspaper I made. We made, I think, 60,000 copies eventually. Passed it all through Sweden. We shared the word of God. I got to minister to the president. God moved in mighty ways, but sometimes I was so alone, so empty, and I forgot. God was saying, Jim, you're serving my purposes. Amen. And the purposes, we can feel we're the only ones sometimes. And the de devil uses that to make us stop being a giver, make us stop being a worker, make us stop being a worship leader, make us stop being a preacher because we start feeling the drudgery and we keep saying why is it that's only me doing it instead of turning it around and say praise God this is my purpose in this life amen, amen. there's an old Persian legend there was a king who needed to find a faithful servant and to find a faithful servant he he got an idea he got took two candidates that he thought would be good and he gave him a fixed wage. He gave him a wage, a fixed wage, and he told him, now, I'm going to pay you by, I'm paying you, this is how much I'm going to pay you, and I want you to go here to this well, and I want you to take this baskets I gave you and fill the baskets and take out the water. Well, after dumping two or three baskets of water, one of them says, what's the use? The basket's full of holes. Our king gave us a basket full of holes. This is drudgery. I can't, but well, the other guy says, but that's okay, he's king. We just do what he says, even if we don't understand it, but he's king. I'm not going to do this. It's just wasting my time. All the water's running out. It's wasting my time, and he went away. And the other guy stayed and all had to do more work, and he took out the water, took out the water, and it was leaking all over, took out the water. And when he got to the bottom, he looked down the well, and there was a diamond ring. And he realized the purpose of the basket with holes, that in case he had inadvertently got the ring too quick, that they would sieve out the water so the ring would not be lost. And the one that continued to the end, the king said, now that's a faithful servant. I'm going to employ him. Many times we feel like that. God, you call me to do this and it's leaking. God, you call this to me. I don't see anything. God, I, I'm doing this and doing this. I'm, I'm giving. I'm working. I'm doing this. And say, God, it's just leaking out. What's happening? And God says, just keep doing. There's a diamond ring down there. 
Are you with me? Last point I really want to bring up is, Pastor, I believe in God's purposes, but I've been serving God for 60, 70 years, and I haven't seen it yet. You know, Abraham never saw that great nation that God promised him except through the eyes of his son that last week we talked about he tried to kill. You might not enter into your purpose and understand it at least until you're as old as Abraham. You may find it early. You may find it late. Never think that you're too old, too weak, too tired, too sick, too th anything to fulfill God's purpose. God will fulfill his purpose if you serve him. Let me give you the verse. Habakkuk 2, verse 3. I'm reading the Amplified because it brings out some verses here. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and it hastens to the end fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint. Though it tarry, wait earnestly for it, because it will surely come. It will not be behindhand on its appointed day. I have yet to see some strong prophetical words that famous men of God, different people have said over me in this church, but I believe it's coming. And even though we may think it's delayed, God is in control. Amen. Look at Simeon in Luke 2, 25. They tell us that Simeon was probably, tradition says he was 113 years old. We know he was very old. And Simeon said, you know, God had promised me I'd see the Messiah before I died. How do you think he felt when he got 99? God, did you forget me? 100? God, almost everybody I knew is dead now. Remember, the average lifespan in that day was less than ours. But he never gave up because he knew that God would one day fulfill his promise. Amen. In closing, you only have a window of time to serve God. That window of time is right now in this generation. I don't think Luther would have gone well in our day. I mean, he loved to go down to the corner and drink beer and some of his famous hymns were actually beer drinking songs that he took the melody and made into, you know, like I tell, I tell you, the A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Originally it was something like, A Mighty Beer I Do Lift Up. <laughs> but he changed it. I don't think we'd like that. We think, oh man, that guy's too carnal. He wasn't. He was a man of his day. Wesley, oh man, he could be difficult at times. Calvin, all these famous people, they were perfect for their day. You are perfect for your day. God called you to this time. He called you to this hour. You, we only have a window to serve that's in our life. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, God, I want to be like David. I want to serve your purposes in my life. Or are you going to live your life living in self-pity, bitterness, blame, selfishness, would have beens compromise, depression. Are you going to rise up and say, I was born for something greater? Amen. Rabbi Zacharias this week was talking about a, a, a Russian pastor. I'm trying to remember it, it's not my note. But he's talking about how there was a man that was drunk on the way to church, and the other pastors had just passed by, kind of looking, what's that guy drunk on Sunday? But this Russian pastor comes up. He got on his knees next to the guy, and he looked him in the eye and says, don't you know that you were born for something greater than this? Don't you know that you were born to hold the fullness of God? Amen. Don't you know you today were born to hold within you the fullness of God? The fullness of God meaning the Holy Spirit, not, not the fullness of all the universe type thing, but we say Jesus is in our heart, don't we? You were born to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we close, let me read one verse, and I'm going to close with a short video. Ephesians 2.10 says this, 
for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand. That means you have a purpose for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in him, in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. 